This video will explore the economic value of American silent film. In the late 18th century, most consumers enjoyed their entertainment in an informal, haphazard, and often non-commercial way. When making a trip, they could suddenly meet a roadside entertainer, and their villages were often visited by traveling showmen, clowns, and troubadours. Seasonal fairs attracted a large variety of musicians, magicians, dancers, fortune tellers, and sword swallowers. Only a few large cities harbored legitimate theaters strictly regulated by the local and national laws. Most Western countries started to deregulate their entertainment industries, enabling many more entrepreneurs to enter the, enter the business and make far larger investments. For example, in circuits of fixed brick and mortar theaters. The United States was the first with liberalization in the late 18th century. Most European countries followed during the 19th century. Britain, for example, deregulated their enter entertainment industry in the mid 1840s and France in the late 1860s. The result of this was that commercial formalized and standardized live entertainment emerged and destroyed a fair part of traditional entertainment. The combined effect of liberalization, innovation, and changes in business organization made the industry grow rapidly throughout the 19th century and integrated local and regional entertainment markets into national ones. By the end of the 19th century, integrated national entertainment industries and markets maximized productivity attainable through process innovations. Creative inputs, circulated swiftly along the venues, coordinated by centralized booking offices, maximizing capital, and organized labor. At the end of the 19th century, in the era of the second industrial revolution, falling working hours, rising disposable income, increasing urbanization, rapidly expanding transport networks, and strong population growth resulted in a sharp rise in the demand for entertainment. The effect of this boom was further rapid growth of live entertainment through process innovations, such as nitrate film and different camera lenses. At the turn of the century, the production possibilities of the existing industry were fully realized, and further innovation could only increase productivity incrementally. At this point, Cinema became industrialized into a modern world of automated, standardized, tradable mass entertainment, integrating the national entertainment markets into an international one. For about the first year, 10 years of its existence, cinema in the United States and elsewhere was mainly a trick and a gadget. Before 1896, the coin-operated kinematograph of Edison was present at fairs and in entertainment venues. Spectators had to throw a coin in the machine and peek through glasses to see the film. The first projections from 1896 onwards attracted large audiences. Frenchman Lumiere had a group of operators who traveled around the world with their cinematograph and showed the pictures in theaters. After a few years, films became a part of the program in vaudeville and sometimes in theater as well. At the same time, traveling cinema emerged. Cinemas would travel around with a tent or mobile theater and set up shop for a short time in towns and villages. These differed from the Lumiere operators and others in that they catered for the general popular audiences, while the former were more upscale parts of theater programs or specialty programs for the bourgeoisie. Lumiere and Edison had a very interesting relationship and it was very contentious. I believe that Lumiere's mysterious death may have involved Thomas Edison, and there are many videos on that. The whole era, which in the U.S. lasted up to about 1905, was a time in which cinema was just one of many new fashions, and it was not certain that it would survive. This changed when Nickelodeon's fixed cinemas with a few hundred seats emerged and quickly spread all over the country between 1905 and 1907. They were built at the time that skating rinks and bowling alleys were built, and so there was a national discussion whether these Nickelodeon skating rinks and bowling alleys would all survive. The Nickelodeons created something that was distinct from other entertainments since it had its own buildings and its own advertising. The emergence of fixed cinemas coincided with a huge growth phase in the business in general. 
Film production increased greatly and film distribution developed into a special activity, often managed by large film producers. However, until about 1914, besides the cinemas, films continued to be combined with existing live entertainment in vaudeville and other theaters. American audiences wanted a diverse portfolio for their entertainment, and they got one. In the United States, the total release negative length increased from 38,000 feet in 1897 to 2 million feet in 1910 to 20 million feet in 1920. So American inventors, American innovators, and entrepreneurs were focusing on nitrate film, focusing on how to lengthen this film to create more productions. When we watch early American film, it's often very short and includes dancing, men running, horses running, something that would not take a lot of film to uh, watch. One thing that historians don't cover as much is the pornographic background of these early films. Nickelodeons were capitalized upon in many cities for their pornographic ability. And because users for the earlier films, the kinematographs, were one user at a time, pornographers felt like they could satisfy their audiences and give a little bit of privacy to their audiences because one person at a time would watch the show and um, it wouldn't be broadcast on a large screen. This is how many uh, movie men made their way to a lot of money very quickly. Zucor, for example, owned some of these Nickelodeons in New York City and along Broadway, and his wealth enabled him to create Paramount Pictures decades later. The prices the Nickelodeons charged were between five and ten cents, and some Nickelodeons let the spectators stay as long as they liked. This was very appealing uh, for a lot of Americans. Um, being able to get outside the house and sit somewhere for a long time was a luxury. Around 1910, larger cinemas started to emerge in very urban areas, more closely resembling theaters than the small and shabby and hastily built Nickelodeons. Because of this, prices increased. Nickelodeon prices varied between a dollar to a dollar and a half for first run movies to five cents for movies that were on their sixth run. Once Nickelodeons and other types of cinemas were established, the industry entered a new stage with the emergence of the feature film. Before 1915, cinema goers saw a succession of many different films, each between 1 and 15 minutes, of varying genres such as cartoons, newsreels, comedies, travelogues, sports films, gymnastics pictures, and mini-dramas. After the mid-1910s, going to the cinema meant watching a feature film, a heavily promoted dramatic film that was often featured in a newspaper with a length that came closer to that of a theater play, based on a famous or well-known story and featuring famous stars. Shorts remained only as side, ditch side dishes. The enabling of American storytelling is really remarkable here. So we start to see films based on stories every American knew, every American was familiar with, and we start to see the emergence of American history in these early films. D.W. Griffith, who had a very strong Southern American background, started to put a lot of different American scenes into his work from Native American attacks to biblical scenes. So this is something that the American people had never seen on the big screen before. The feature film emerged when cinema owners discovered that films with a higher quality and length enabled them to ask for higher ticket prices and get more people into the cinemas, resulting in much higher profits. Even if cinemas needed to pay more for the film rental from the small studios and from the small producers. The discovery that consumers would turn their back on packages of shorts like newsreels, sports, cartoons, as the quality of features increased, set in motion a quality race between film producers. There was a lot of investment in portfolios of feature films, spending large sums on well-known silent film stars, 
rights to famous novels and theater plays, extravagant sets, star directors, etc. A contributing factor to this was the demise of the monopoly, the Motion Picture Patents Company, a cartel that tried to mo monopolize film production and distribution while owning patents for motion pictures. Between 1908 and 1912, this Edison-backed monopoly restricted quality artificially by setting limits on film length and film rental prices. When William Fox and the U.S. Department of Justice started legal action in 1912, the power of this monopoly quickly waned and independent film studios came to dominate the industry instead of Edison-backed players. In the United States, the motion picture industry became the internet of the 1910s. When companies put the word motion pictures in their initial public offerings, investors would flock to it. So studios were being funded by small investors around the United States. This was not a national network. This was a really organic, homegrown effort. However, many of these companies went bankrupt, especially during the depression of the 1920s were dissolved or were taken over. A few survived and became the Hollywood studio studios, which we know today, including MGM, and I covered MGM in a previous video. Other studios you might recognize are Warner Brothers, Universal, 20th Century Fox, Columbia, and United Artists. At this time, working in American film became one of the top employers in the country, just behind the steel mills. And when you look at silent film sets, you're looking at something entirely American made. All of the costumes, all of the set work, the story, the story rights, the actors, the actresses, you're looking at something that was filmed in a corner of America, maybe on a rooftop, maybe in a field somewhere. Granted, sometimes the lenses were made in Germany or other parts of Europe for the cameras, but you are really looking at a completely American-made product. Contrast this today to any industry in the United States. Much of it is based externally. If you go to a clothing store in the United States today, unless it's a thrift store or some other kind of store, you're going to be buying clothing that was made in garment factories of Asia. So, you know, to be able to look upon something that was entirely American made is just a treasure for Americans today. The emerging Hollywood studios benefited from mover advantages in feature film production. These huge studios, many of which were funded by banks, owned international distribution networks. They could offer cinemas large portfolios of films at a discount called block booking, sometimes before the films were even made, something called blind bidding. The American origin of the feature films in the 1910s established U.S. films as a kind of brand, leaving consumers with high switching costs to try out films from other national origins such as Germany, England, or France. It would be extremely costly for European companies to re-enter international distribution, produce large portfolios, jumpstart film quality, and establish a new brand of films all at the same time. Regardless of this, the German and French studios really persevered, and German silent film in this time created an entirely new genre. British film, on the other hand, didn't really see a renaissance until Hitchcock got involved. And so a lot of British actors were moving to the United States to act in American movies um, for decades after the 1910s. A third factor was the rise of Hollywood as a production location. Many stars lived in Hollywood. The large existing American Northeast Coast film industry and the film industry in Chicago with SNA Studios and the newly emerging film industry in Florida declined as American film companies started to locate to Southern California. The California government was very friendly to American studios. The um, turning of a blind eye to a lot of organized crime, brothels, drug use, 
um, certainly helped the American film studio at the time. The sharing of inputs such as actors and actresses between the studios also facilitated this and allowed higher returns. Studios would lend out their actors and actresses and it helped that they could lend out their actors and actresses just down the road. The studios lowered costs because creative inputs had less downtime, needed to travel less, could participate in many tryouts to achieve optimal casting, and could be rented out easily to competitors. Hollywood also attracted new creative inputs through non-monetary means. Even more than money, creative inputs wanted to maximize fame and professional recognition. For an actress, an offer to work with the world's best directors, costume designers, lighting specialists, and makeup artists was difficult to decline, so the Hollywood studios relied on this. A thick market for specialized supply and demand existed. Companies could easily rent out excess studio capacity. For example, during the nighttime, B films were made, so the studios were just constantly running. And again, that is why so many Americans were able to be employed. You needed Americans able to build set pieces, able to build sets, able to do props and special effects, lighting. All of these things kept the American film industry going strong. A producer was quite likely to find highly specific products or services needed somewhere in Hollywood. At the time, the Llewellyn Steelworks was running at full capacity in Hollywood, and so anything made of steel was easily accessible in Southern California. While a European industrial film district may have been competitive and even have a lower overall cost quality ratio than Hollywood, a first European major would have a substantially higher cost quality ratio and would therefore not easily enter the international film market. If entry did happen, the Hollywood studios would do their best to suppress newcomers and they would buy successful creative inputs away, such as the actors and the makeup artists, since they could realize higher returns on these inputs. This resulted in American films with an even higher perceived quality, thus perpetuating the situation of a total focal point on American film. Sunlight, climate, and the variety of landscape in California with mountains, deserts, ocean scenes were of course favorable to film production but were not unique. Locations such as Florida, Italy, Spain, and southern France offered similar conditions. This was known to American actors and is partly why Orson Welles filmed so much of his work in Spain. The emerging Hollywood studios benefited from first mover advantages in feature film production. They owned the international distribution networks. They were able to buy out small businesses to enable these international distribution networks. They could offer cinemas large portfolios of films at a discount. And the American origin of the feature films of the 1910s has established the American films as a kind of brand. A 700, like I said, that's just what I've said. A 700 seat cinema with a production capacity of 39,000 spectator hours a week, weekly fixed costs for employees of $500, and an average admission price of five cents per spectator hour needed a film selling at least 10,000 spectator hours. Films needed a minimum selling capacity to cover cinema fixed costs. Producers could only price down low-budget films to just above the threshold level to make any money. So now you see advertising enter the room. Because films needed a minimum selling capacity, propaganda, advertising needed to be pushed out so that producers, film studios could meet their costs. To secure an audience, film producers borrowed branding techniques from other consumer goods industries. But the short product life cycle forced them to extend the brand beyond one product. So they started using trademarks or stars or celebrity to buy existing brands, such as famous plays or novels which were known to the American public, and to deepen the product life cycle by licensing their brands. You can read more about some of these techniques in my video on Fay Ray and the theaters of the Eastern Shore. 
studios started treating their stars as simply numbers in the 1930s. There was a lot of bank influence in the studios. For example, vice presidents of Goldman Sachs banks would move over to Warner Brothers and that's how the banks and the studios would mix. They would employ the same people. For example, some of the surviving analysis they did of actors shows that Jimmy Stewart was 11 percentage points more popular among the richest consumers than among the poorest, while Lana Turner differed only a few percentage points. Additional segmentation by city size seemed to matter, since substantial differences were found. For example, Clark Gable was 10 percentage points more popular in small cities than in large ones, probably due to his role in Gone with the Wind. Of the richest consumers, 51% wanted to see a movie starring Gable, but altogether, these richest consumers constituted just 14% of Gable's market, while the 57% poorest Gable fans constituted 34% of the market. The increases in Gable's popularity roughly coincided with the film releases, suggesting that while producers used Gable partially for the brand awareness of his name, each film subsequently increased or maintained his awareness in what seems to have been a self-reinforcing process through advertisement. Stars were never treated this way beforehand, but now the film studios were crawling with bankers film stars saw themselves reduced to a number on a spreadsheet. So the main value of stars and stories lay not in their ability to predict successes, but in their services as giant publicity machines, which optimized advertising effectiveness by rapidly amassing high levels of brand awareness. After a film's release, information such as word of mouth and reviews would affect its success. The young age at which stars reach their peak and the disproportionate income distribution even among the superstars confirmed that stars were paid for their ability to generate publicity, good publicity or bad. Likewise, because stories were paid several times as much as original screenplays, they were at least partially bought for their popular appeal. See my video uh, about Barbara Lamar and her writings. Between 1900 and 1938, output of the entertainment industry measured in spectator hours, or how much people were watching movies, grew substantially in the US, Britain, and France, varying from 3 to 11% per year over a period of nearly 40 years. So we see the public watching movies all the time. The output per worker increased from 2,400 spectator hours in the U.S. in 1900 to almost 35,000 in 1938. This became everybody's entertainment. No more country fairs. No more live music. It was movies, movies, movies. In Britain, it increased from 16,000 spectator hours in 1900 to 37,000 and in France from 1,500 spectator hours in 1900 to just 8,000 in 1938. Another noteworthy feature is that the labor productivity in entertainment varied less across countries in the late 1930s than it did in 1900. We see the same storylines existing across all countries um, into the late 1930s. There is very little cultural differentiation. Studios are making films that have global appeal and not necessarily local cultural appeal. I've personally seen this change with studios focusing on their own royals, for example, um, their own monarchies, their own histories. I really wish the United States would do that even though we don't have royals. We could certainly focus on all of our very accomplished men and women, um, the people who helped make this country, but instead we focus on comic books. Part of the reason there was so much growth is that cinema technology made entertainment partially tradable. We see movies going from nitrate film 
to cassette tapes, to Blu-ray, to DVDs, to MP4 files. Therefore, forced productivity in similar directions occurred in all countries. The tradable part of the entertainment industry would now exert competitive pressure on the non-tradable part, which is our local stories, our local costumes, our local traditions.